Frontier Fighters. Frontier Fighters, the triumphant march of those whose daring deeds of exploration and trail-breaking saved for posterity the glorious West. Among those who first saw the wonders of Yellowstone Park and tried to convince an unbelieving, scoffing world were John Coulter and the famous scout Jim Bridger. As our story opens, the year is 1849. To the editor of a leading Western newspaper and a group of hangers-on, Jim Bridger is saying... Bill... Any man that'll print what I say about Yellowstone will go down in history. Well, Jim Bridger, I'll just sleep on some of that stuff you told me. Bridger, I'm a curious fella. What I'm about to say ain't no slur on your veracity. But do you expect a full-grown man to believe your fish story? (laughs) It's gospel that I hooked a trout in the lake, swung it around, let it fall in a pool of boiling water, and cooked it right on the line. you none for laughs. Seeing is believing. But even if some of you yokels did see, you wouldn't believe anyway. You ain't got no imagination. That's all wrong with you. Yes, you sir. ain't traveled like I have. Now, Jim, I have half a notion to believe what you say about waterfalls and geysers and petrified forests, but when it comes to that fish story... Well, that fish story ain't the biggest whopper old Jim's told us. No, sir. <laughs> Not by a long way. It's about that whole cliff of glass, so clear you can see clean through it. (laughs) And the one about fording that creek and the horse's hooks having shrunk in size by the time he got to the shore. (laughs) Oh, now, gents, I came here to, to give the editor of this newspaper a little historical fact. But I reckon you ain't ready for the truth yet. Well, I guess it's time for me to be hitting out for home. Guess I'd better not tell my old lady none of them biggins you told us, Jim. Because <laughs> she'd swear I'd imbibe too freely of fire wire. <laughs> so right, Jim. So long, Jim. He certainly is Hey, Bridget, don't you think you'd better scale down some of these whoppers a little? Bill, no matter what I'd say about Yellowstone, wouldn't be gospel, even if I had my hand laid on a stack of Bibles. Now, Jim, I've known you for a long time. You made a name for yourself as a scout and a guide and interpreter among the Redmen. But, Jim, just as one friend to another, you uh, haven't had too much to drink, have you? (laughs) Bill, I'm as sober as a judge. No, don't let this worry you none. Well, I am worried. What if some of this tall talk gets around? Oh, it won't do no harm. Americans ain't serious. Nobody's going to run over to Wyoming to see if I'm telling the truth. (laughs) Well, goodbye, Bill. Goodbye, Jim. When you get back to Yellowstone, why don't you send me a little item I can use sometime without getting laughed out of the country? (laughs) (laughs) Poor Jim. Ah, That's too bad. He's young, too. 
for having his mind get a twist in it like that for telling whoppers. <laughs> Jim Bridger told the truth in a day and age when people were poorly traveled. Then came the years 1869, 70, and 71. And two decades after Jim Bridger had failed to convince his generation, Yellowstone was discovered again. And this time the world knew that in the heart of Wyoming, nature had placed the wonderland of the world. An ardent champion of Yellowstone was Dr. F.V. Hayden, who in 1870 explored the country with Captain Barlow of the United States Army. Thrilled with their discoveries, they were about to complete their chore when suddenly they came upon a miner's camp. Yeah, looks like some mighty rich digging here. Yeah, don't give a hoot about all them wonders of nature. Well, we got it all to ourselves. Once the word gets out about a gold strike, there'll be a rush. That's my word. Yeah, Why, what are you men doing? Creepers told you what we found out. His people just smell gold. That's a deal, mister. I'm Captain Ball of the United States Army. Well, all right, Captain. We'll be having some grub when the sun starts going down. You and your buddy can fall, too. Planning some extensive mining operations? Well, we're aiming to get what gold we can out of these hills. Of course, if there's going to be a boom, why, this whole territory will be torn up with mines and dumps. Captain Barlow? I guess our work has cut out for us. Ain't you putting on the feed bag with us? Oh, uh, thank you, no. Well, Captain Barlow... Our report is completed. Desecrating these glories of nature for a few handfuls of gold. Mining camps, dumps, scarred and blackened mountainsides. We'll out with these miners if we can. Such glories as we have seen must be preserved for posterity. We'll head for the nation's capital and call on Congressman Claggett and the famous lecturer, Mr. Langford, at once. <laughs> Mr. Hayden, Mr. Langford, I'm entirely in accord with your plan. But to get such a bill written that would save Yellowstone, get friends for it, lobby for it... Now, Mr. Would... Claggett, yes? once such a bill as that which we propose is even rumored about, it will excite the warmest admiration. Hundreds of friends will rush to the defense <laughs> of it. <laughs> hey, Dr. Hayden, you speak of Yellowstone as though it were a beautiful, defenseless woman about to be abducted by a band of marauding Indians. Well, the fate of Yellowstone would be worse than that. It's one thing to be abducted, another to be desecrated. Can you picture this wonderland of the West with scarred mountainsides swarming with men who have lost their love of nature in their greedy search for gold? <clears throat> You are very persuasive, too, Mr. Langford. I'm all for such a plan, but, you know, it's often years before you can arouse the country to the need of such legislation. But the Congress sits in Washington. We're in Washington. The theater of action is here. Yes, yes, it's all true, all true. But Congress is much more affected by what it hears outside of the hours of debate than during them. However, I'll start the ball rolling. I'll see the Secretary of the Interior tomorrow. Oh, wait, but... uh, Langford, I've just had a brainstorm. And another, Mr. Hayden, if Congress is affected by, by what it hears outside of uh, hours of debate, it shall hear plenty. Oh, and you have a plan of action for yourself, Dr. Hayden. Huh? Oh, no. For Mr. Langford. For me? Yes. You're one of the most famous lecturers in the country. From this moment on, you have a new theme. Yellowstone National Park. Well, Dr. Hayden, that's a very good piece of political strategy. At such short notice, I don't know what kind of bookings I can get, either on Lyceum or Red Path Circuit. You won't have to put foot out of Washington. Teas, luncheons, after dinner, Sunday salons. But what interest possible can women have in Yellowstone as a national park? Hey, women have a greater interest than you think, Mr. Langford. And anything that interests them, interests their husbands. Be they representatives, senators, chief justices, or even presidents. Presidents? Mm -hmm. Langford, didn't you say you knew Mrs. Grant? Yes, but uh, it's purely a social contact. Well, it's too bad I don't know the wife of the chief executive that well. Yes, I know. But... I'm sure that Mrs. Grant would be most happy to have you speak at a White House salon. <clears throat> Informally, of course. But I couldn't possibly suggest that she speak to, to the... the president. You won't have to. 
You give the talk, introduce me to the first lady, and <laughs> I'll do the rest. <laughs> Yes, yes, my dear, I know. But I can't possibly present a bill to Congress. That's the duty of congressmen. But Ulysses, you as president, when such a bill comes, can sign it. I've signed more than my share of bills this session. Besides, I doubt if it will even get to a committee this year. Well, the bill to make Yellowstone a national park is being talked about by everyone. Including the wife of the president. <laughs> well... I suppose if something is so ardently supported by you, it must have merit. Oh, I can think of nothing finer on the part of any president of the United States than to be remembered for having saved such a paradise to future generations. Well, you will have me do something for posterity yet. <laughs> oh, you Ulysses, all that any nation has is its natural resources, its, its scenic wonders. It becomes our duty to guard and treasure these things. Guard and treasure our natural resources. Hmm. That sounds like Congressman Cladgett. Why, it sounds like anyone, doesn't it, who loves America? You couldn't just by the smallest chance have invited Claggett to your salon. Why, I, I did invite Mr. Lang. And Dr. Hayden and Claggett came along with him. <laughs> Julia, the place to lobby is not in the living room of the White House. However, we'll see... We'll see. Oh, you Lizzie's, it isn't that I want it for myself. It's for the country. For Wyoming. The people of this territory would be so proud. Julia, as soon as this bill is introduced and passes both houses, I'll sign such a bill and make it a law. An act to set apart a certain tract of land lying near the headwaters of the Yellowstone River as a public park. Be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress Assembly. At the tract of land. <laughs> Approved. March 1st, 1872. Signed by James G. Blaine, Speaker of the House, Skylar Colfax, Vice President of the United States. And so, through the discoveries of Jim Bridger, that grand old man of the trails, the patriotic idealism and the wonderful energy of Congressman Claggett, Dr. Hayden, and N.P. Langford, who can visit Wyoming today without realizing that in her vast embracing arms lies indeed one of the great scenic wonders of the world? Other lovers of nature and frontier fighters brought into the fold of government parks such famous natural wonders as Yosemite in California, Mount Rainier National Park in Washington, Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. And so we bring to a close another episode in the lives of men who fought for an ideal and won. <laughs>